I think it's really important that we have these exchanges, um, especially to foster mutual understanding. Um, because I think when we are in what undoubtedly is a very challenging global um, situation, it is really important that we understand where um, the other side comes from, what is driving the thinking. And what I'm trying to do in my short remarks is really just uh, to set out what I think is going to be uh, on the minds of Europeans um, over the coming year and how that will affect uh, EU-China relations. I, I think what has to be um, recognized is that what will be on the minds of Europeans uh, is Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. Um, both in terms of the war itself, but also in terms of the consequences this has um, for a variety of different areas, including, of course, uh, energy, cost of living, uh, economic development in Europe. Um, so this is going to be um, on the top of the agenda. It is a watershed moment for Europe. Uh, it does put into question uh, the um, ideals of Europe um, in terms of mutual cooperation, in terms of economic interdependence, also leading to political cooperation. Um, so it is a very important moment in European history. Um, and that also means that uh, the end of this war can only be uh, an end where Russia does not gain from this aggression. So this is very clear for Europe that um, uh, there isn't a balance between the two sides. Uh, we have an aggressor and we have a country which is defending its territorial integrity, its existence. Um, so in the end, Ukraine has to win this war. And that is what Europe is going to support. Um, and that will also influence its international relations. Um, so in the context of that war, I would say one of the things which we have to try to avoid is that Europe is forced to choose sides um, because in this moment in time uh, it is very clear that despite the differences uh, the European Union has with the United States, the United States is still the predominant ally of the European Union and it is still the security guarantor um, for Europe. So that relationship um, in my mind, will not be questioned uh, fundamentally. I think the second uh, um, question attached to that is how much support is given to Ukraine um, and how much support is given to Russia, um, also by international actors. Um, and it has to be very clear from a European perspective, uh, Russia's attack is not only an attack on Ukraine, it's an attack on the Western way of life, our values, our interests. Um, so any support to Russia is also a support um, which is prolonging the war against our way of life. Um, so that also, I think, uh, is important. So does that mean the relationship between EU and China is going to um, get better. Um, there was a question of is there going to be a breakthrough or are we going to muddle through? I think also we have to put the question could it deteriorate further because there are also risks. Um, and I think that depends on um, also identifying the opportunities where we can work together. Um, and for me, um, the opportunities are on the one hand, um, in terms of um, finding global common um, objectives. Um, Europe is still committed to the global multilateral system, to the rules-based order. So trying to find a way of supporting the global rules-based order, I think it's very important. And within that, um, I think it's also, and it has already been mentioned by others, um, it is very important that we start building climate change in even more than we have done up to now um, because 
in the end, and I'm going to be rather blunt on this, we are collectively failing. Um, and we have to recognize that we cannot keep going like we are going at the moment because we are um, going to hand uh, a world to the next generations which will become unlivable. And that cannot be the outcome um, of what is happening now. So our generation has a an obligation to coming generations to ensure that we tackle climate change better. And what we have just seen uh, in the COP process is not good enough. It cannot be the answer um, that we uh, are looking for. So I think we have to work much more on climate change and we have to start building it also in, um, for example, into trade. Um, trade has to become greener. Um, that also means we have to discuss, have a discussion around the carbon border adjustment mechanism, around how we can measure these kind of um, carbon footprints of uh, trade of goods um, being transported around the world. Um, and it might also mean that we have to um, turn down globalization in some areas um, to protect the environment better. So for me, um, looking ahead to trade and investment, I think we have to recognize that you cannot separate trade and investment from all these other considerations. Uh, I think we are still going to see a positive um, uh, increase in terms of trade and investment, but it will also be more conflictual uh, in some areas when it touches um, what I would call Europe's four great transformations, the transformations we're going through, the technological revolution, uh, the climate change um, revolution, our demographic change, um, and what now is added to that is this economic security dimension, energy security dimension. Um, so trade and investment has to be seen within that context. Uh, and there, I think, um, and that's coming back um, to this kind of exchange, I think this is exactly where these exchanges are really important, that there's also an understanding of the other side's intent. Why are we doing the things we are doing? Um, they are aimed at achieving certain objectives. Um, is there a way uh, we can find where we share some of those objectives um, at the international level? And again, climate change is far too important um, to continue to neglect it as we are doing at the moment. So I'll end on that, but I'm very much looking forward uh, to further exchanges um, and especially in-person exchanges. I think uh, these discussions are even more important, better uh, when you can do them face to face.